Princeton University. From the creators of All American. Well, if it ain't Simone Hicks. Juggling school, tennis. It's your journey. What if I made the wrong choice coming to college here? You do you. You are looking at the new face of HBCU baseball. What if I'm not good enough? Basically, you're scared every damn day, bro. The series premiere. Never let anything keep you from your dream. All American Homecoming. Tonight on The CW. Tonight at 9, only on DCW 50, Washington CW. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. The 25th of November 2021 is a significant and sad anniversary. On this date 20 years ago, CIA officer Mike Spann was killed in Afghanistan. Mike was the first CIA and American casualty in what will go on to be the longest conflict in American history. On today's podcast, I'm joined by journalist and author Toby Harnden, and we discuss his book, First Casualty, that takes a look at the first CIA team that Mike Spann was a part of that went into Afghanistan. I hope you enjoy this episode. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Toby, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you on. Please, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, I'm in my mid-50s, which seems all very surprising, but uh, better than the alternative. Uh, but, I, you know, I started, I grew up, uh, my father was in the Navy. Mm. I was born in Portsmouth. I grew up mostly in the north of England, Cheshire, mm. Manchester. I uh, joined the Navy from school. I got a, a cadetship, university cadetship, it was called, to Oxford. I got the place sort of separately to study history. Then did a year's naval training, um, uh, then three years at university studying history, and uh, then was a, a naval officer for sort of six and a half years after graduating, um, based in the Ministry of Defence, various ships. Um, then I decided uh, on, on journalism that I wanted to make a career of journalism, so I've got my foot in the door at the Telegraph. Yeah. Uh, my big break was sort of 1996, so I got sent to Northern Ireland. Um, I spent three and a half years there and really sort of immersed myself in the troubles and in the conflict. And it happened to be also the biggest news story in the world at the yeah. time. Yeah. So that's sort of a fantastic period journalistically. Uh, that led to a posting in Washington, which in a way was sort of somewhat outside my what I'd expected and what I thought were my strengths because I, I'd really got into, um, you know, obviously I had a military background, but the military and terrorism and war and the sort of intersection of politics and conflict which at the time didn't seem like it existed, particularly in Washington, you know, which is sort of, you know, men in suits in Oval Offices and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, 9-11 happened and I was in downtown Washington, D.C. on, on 9-11, you know, biggest sort of work day of my life. And, you know, I was, it's funny looking back. I mean, I was somewhat surprised, uh, somewhat sort of frustrated mm. in the months afterwards because I couldn't get to Afghanistan because, of course, the Telegraph very correctly said, no, 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 you're... You know, you're well sort of um, settled in Washington and mm. you've, you've got good contacts and you know the story and the, and the people you need to cover the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, so I stayed in Washington through to, uh, you know, the start of Afghanistan and um, and then the, the invasion of Iraq. And I remember sort of having my head in my hands when the Saddam statue came down. I can't believe I've missed this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, spoiler alert, it wasn't over in mm. Iraq or Afghanistan. And so... You know, I was then based in the Middle East in Jerusalem, but spent a lot of time in, in Iraq going in and out. Um, I mean, I then uh, sort of pulled back from the Middle East a little bit and was in London for a while. I was in jail. I was jailed in Zimbabwe in 2005 for two weeks uh, under the Mugabe regime. Um, I then uh, married an American in 2006, went back to the US. And I've been here in the sort of Washington area ever since. But in that period... I wrote a book in 2011 about the Welsh Guards in Helmand province. A friend of mine, Rupert Thornelow, who was the commanding officer, was killed in action there, 1st of July, 2009, uh, which you know, led to me going over there and spending quite a lot of time over there. 
and uh, and then more recent, you know, then moved to the Sunday Times, um, and then I guess coming up to three years ago now, um, I moved away from the the sort of foreign correspondent world, and that led to this book, First Casualty, uh, which was a story really which goes right back to the beginning of my time here, because right back to nine eleven, because um, you know it had a profound effect on on me as it did on everyone here. Um, and I think, you know, it was one of the reasons that sort of led to me becoming an American citizen in mm. 2009. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. And I was always very aware of the story of, of, of Mike Spann, um, the former Marine Corps officer who was, you know, he's the eponymous first casualty, who, you know, who was killed November the 25th, 2001, a CIA officer. And I remember being sort of fascinated by him and listening to his widow, Shannon, giving a very moving eulogy at Arlington Cemetery. And then everything moved on. But, uh, you know, in a couple of years later, when I was actually in Iraq, strangely enough, um, somebody said, have you ever seen the footage of that CIA officer that was with Mike Spann in the dusty fort in Afghanistan, you know, sort of running for his life? And I hadn't seen it, um, even though I've you know, written a couple of news stories about Mike Spann at the time of his death. But I watched the footage and it was a guy called David Tyson, who was a CIA case officer who was with Mike Spann that day. And he just... He'd just seen Mike being killed, and he'd he'd run out of the southern half of the of the fort, killing his way out. I mean, he had no other option, and killed I don't know two or three dozen Al Qaeda fighters, and you know, and then he was he sort of burst into uh, a building at the northern end of the fort and sort of bumped into a German TV reporter and lots of journalists and random Afghans, and you could see his eyes. That you know, you talk about the thousand yard stare. And he's just sort of staring eyes. And, you know, and I, I discussed it with him very recently, you know, about the sort of the psychological trauma he was going through. I mean, you could, but I could see that this, this was a guy who God knows what he'd been through. Um, and he didn't know whether he was going to live for another five minutes, another five hours or what, but he was in, a, you know, he was in another world. Um, and so I was fascinated by him. And I eventually, um, I tracked him down in 2013. And, you know, strange way things work here. He was in Vienna, Virginia, which is just sort of, you know, t sort of 10 miles away or something. And I met him in a Panera Bread. And um, he was very friendly, but he was still serving in the CIA. He, he'd actually become, you know, one of their top Russia experts. And um, he couldn't really talk. I mean, he couldn't talk freely and fully. And so it wasn't until he retired at the very beginning of last year that he contacted me and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to talk. And it was sort of from that that I started to piece to piece the book together. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. One question just popped into my head, maybe a bit of a dumb, broad question, but I've always been fascinated by how journalists operate in a war zone. I mean, like you just mentioned those German journalists Dave, David bumped into, and I've, I've seen yeah. that footage too. It's quite strange. Um, and it would seem to be quite a lot of press during that activity at that time. But how does one sort of operate in a war zone? How do you not get yourself, like, killed? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes you do, uh, but you try not to. Uh, it's sort of, I mean, generally speaking, it's not as dangerous as it might seem mm. uh, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. And it's not maybe as dangerous as some journalists would, would like you to believe, mm. you know, because mm. obviously there's a there's a bravado about war reporting, which everybody, including me, you know, is sort of touched by. Um, but, you know, I mean, when I was, you know, a sort of teenager and at university and stuff, I did a lot of backpacking and interrailing and I, I got, had a Greyhound bus ticket around the United States. And so a lot of it's just sort of the logistics, you know, being sort of resourceful, trying to get visas. Sometimes you have to bribe people. Um, you, you have to persuade uh, people that don't really want to help you to help you. And you, you find, you, you know, so a lot of it is just getting to the place and getting mm -hmm. in. And then I remember in, in Iraq, you know, you had to get the right embeds with the right unit. So I was in Fallujah in 2004, and I felt like I'd been through a battle just to get there, just to persuade them to take me. They wanted to put me in Ramadi, and then we I had to sort of get my way out of Ramadi and get to Fallujah and attach myself to a unit. And so I felt I'd achieved something before, you know, we even went into what was the biggest battle since uh, Vietnam. But, you know, you find other journalists who um, are good sort of teammates uh, to people who... Uh, I mean, I think, you know, with a bit of self-knowledge now that I can be uh, a little bit reckless. You know, I tend towards the reckless end rather than the anxious end of the spectrum. And so I would, and I did recognize this early on. And so I would sort of team up with people who were, 
maybe a little bit more cautious than me, um, but not too much because you want to be in the same zone. Otherwise, you know, I'll be like, I, I want to go do it. And the other person's like, no way, I'm, I'm staying here. And you, you don't you don't want much of that. But what you do want is another person who can say, ah, can we just slow down and think about this a little bit more? But then equally for the other person, they might want somebody who's like, no, no, listen, okay, we can do it. This is how we do it. This is how we get in quickly. This is how we get out. And so it, it's just sort of, it, it's just sort of like that. And you, and you know, like as with the soldier, probably not as intensely, but you don't know how you'll react until you mm. sort of get there. Mm. And so I found actually, um, and I, I attribute this to the Navy. I, I remember doing a, I, I had to be, uh, I had to, uh, be in charge of a fire exercise for the entire ship during it was flag officers sea training in uh, off uh, Weymouth, and all these inst- in- instructors would come in and, and and they would mark you, and you know it, and it was very lonely. I was the officer in charge of the firefighting for the whole ship, and everybody who wasn't on duty was off the ship, and and I was I was advised by an, another officer that well, what you can't do is you know tear off your jacket, be sweating, rolling up your sleeves, swearing, getting all agitated. You need to project calm. And I did that during that exercise. And and it worked really well. And I think I just learned to be calm. Like I, I felt that panic and getting agitated and letting your fear take control of you is completely counterproductive. And so I did find that in Iraq, when um, sort of bad things happened, I just felt this sort of calm descend on me which can be dangerous because you need you know you need sometimes you you, you know you need you don't want to push everything out uh you, you need to you know take in information as well um but you know there were some people some reporters who you know had all the right gear and the flat jackets and the talk and everything and were sort of almost pseudo soldiers in their sort of bearing but they just sort of went to pieces when bad things happened and then other sort of scruffy freelance photographers who were just amazing. So, yeah, I mean, it's a strange, it's a sort of a strange world of its own, uh, yeah. war reporting. Yeah, fantastic. There was a really good book I read years ago, and I've forgotten the title of it. It was all about sort of being a reporter in Afghanistan embedded with the army, and it sounded pretty intense at times. So, yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. Well, thank you for sure. that. Just for the benefit of the audience, can you just give us a sort of brief overview of what this book is about, First Casualty? Sure. So it's a 9-11 story in, mm. in, in many ways. You know, it's you know the untold story of the CIA mission, to avenge 9-11. So at the center of the book is, uh, the, you know, the t- is Team Alpha, who are eight CIA officers who were the first uh, Americans to go behind enemy lines after 9-11. So the book starts on 9-11. There's a, one CIA officer, uh, David Tyson, who I've mm-hmm. always mentioned, mm-hmm. already mentioned, uh, was uh, on, a, on a flight from Tashkent, where he was stationed, to London for a, um, a conference meeting about Stinger missiles, you know, which had been supplied to the Mujahideen by the CIA in the 1980s. So he was in the air, didn't know anything about it until he landed at Heathrow. Another member of the team who was the only Green Beret, Justin Sapp, so the other seven were serving CIA officers. He was underwater in Key West, at the Special Forces Diver School. Uh, and then Mike Spann, the former Marine Corps officer, was in CIA headquarters. And his wife, also a CIA officer, was on maternity leave in a giant supermarket in Manassas Park, Virginia. So it starts on 9-11 because, you know, for the for the country, you know, this was in, and the world, you know, an incredible moment, which obviously a sort of a generation of people mm. didn't really experience personally. Um, and it's it's about how the Pentagon didn't have a plan, remarkably, for Afghanistan. Uh, the CIA did because partly because of the Mujahideen era in the 1980s and fighting the Soviets and a sort of proxy Cold War uh, conflict, but also because of Al Qaeda's activities in the late 90s. The, East Africa embassy bombings in 1998, the USS Cole um, uh, bombing in uh, late 2000, and uh, the Millennium Plot in, in 2000. And so for two years before 9-11, small CIA teams have been flying in and out of the Panjshir Valley from Tajikistan. And David Tyson was actually on the first one of those in October 1999. And so that had led to a thing called the Blue Sky Memo, which was a sort of, it wasn't really a plan, but it was a sort of a, a formula, an idea concept for how operations against al-Qaeda in Afghanistan could work. And it's what the CIA wanted to do, but the Clinton administration wasn't up for it, and the Bush administration wasn't up for it. But on 9-11, all of a sudden, you know, 
the atmosphere is completely transformed. The gloves are off. We need to get in there. And so Kofa Black, who was the counterterrorism center director at CIA, had the plan. Uh, General Tommy Franks was, you know, much to the annoyance and anger, really, of of Donald Rumsfeld, the Pentagon chief. Uh, didn't have anything, you know. He, you know, he had a plan for two hundred thousand troops, you know, going in in six months' time. Um, but Bush, um, you know, opted for the for the CIA plan. And so you had a, a small team called Jawbreaker that went in on September the 26th. But they went into the Panjshir Valley, which was a Northern Alliance controlled zone, sort of safe zone, and, and actually were stuck in place for many, many weeks. Whereas Team Alpha went into the mountains, Taliban controlled territory, and they linked up with Abdul Rashid, uh, Dostum, Uzbek, ethnic Uzbek warlord, and a sort of, you know, sort of a bad guy from central casting who was actually America's sort of, for that period, America's staunchest ally and exactly what they needed because he wanted to go and kill the Taliban yeah. and was, you know, and was prepared to do it. So it's the story of those eight. Mm. But of course, around that, then you had Green Berets coming in three days later. So you had an ODA, Operational Detachment Alpha. So 12 Green Berets who came in and sort of fought alongside Team Alpha. So the ODA uh, worked on the tactical military piece of, of helping the Afghans defeat uh, the Taliban on the battlefield, and particularly coordinating with U.S. air power. Yeah, and there's a film about that, isn't there? I think. Yeah, there's a film called Twelve Strong. That's it. In which there's one, <laughs> the CIA was kind of completely written out of it. There's sort of one composite CIA character mm. in the in the middle for sort of two or three minutes, and that's <laughs> it. But in fact, Team Alpha was there three days earlier, and Team Alpha was sort of co-located. They were working on Al Qaeda. Um, much more than the ta- focused on Al Qaeda rather than the Taliban, but they were also working the tribes. And so there's a complex, you know, Dostum's ally was Atta Mohammed Noor, who's a Tajik, who was also a rival. And when they landed, it looked like Atta might actually attack Dostum and maybe the Americans would get caught in the crossfire. So they had to work all that out. They took in $3 million in a big sort of case of non sequential $100 bills, you know, and yeah. Dostum got a million dollars on landing. So <laughs> oh, there's, wow. you know, there's all. all you know, any, any leverage you can have. Mm, mm, um, mm. But, you know, then you had more Green Berets. And then eventually, you know, pretty quickly, you know, November the 10th, Mazari Sharif is captured. First first sort of domino to fall mm. um, in 2001. And um, and then the Americans move into Mazari Sharif. And then everything sort of changes. And there's a, the Taliban's last stand um, – is seen as being in Kunduz, mm. uh, way over to sort of hundred miles uh, to the east, and um, it looks like things have you know it's over in Masri Sharif. Well, certainly, that's the view in sort of Washington and London, um, but it wasn't. And you you know you had four hundred Al Qaeda prisoners um, who ended up uh, being put in into Kalajangi, this nineteenth century fort, um, and then you have the events of. November the 25th, 2001, which is the uprising, Mike Spann is killed, and then a six-day battle. And at that time, you had that uh, SBS, Special Boat Service, uh, eight eight of those guys who were in Masri Sharif. Uh, you know, ironically enough, they were there because Blair didn't want them going to Kunduz because he'd been briefed that it was going to be a bloodbath and he kind of wanted his cake and eat it. And, you know, he, he didn't, he wanted, he wanted to be shoulder to shoulder and have the British troops there, but he didn't want them to be involved in any sort of nasty stuff. Especially so early. <laughs> <laughs> right. The the rules of engagement or the you know, national caveat was that they, they could fire when fired upon, but they couldn't fire offensively. So you can imagine that the SBS guys were not particularly happy with this. They'd been made to paint their Land Rovers white. So they looked like peacekeepers. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they had, you know, general purpose machine guns. And yeah. so come November the 25th, when you had a 15 man rest sort of, you know, what they call here, like a pickup team, you know, mm. just sort of improvised, you know, throw them together, whoever's there, you know, that eight of them, uh, one of whom actually was a Navy Se- a US Navy SEAL on exchange with the SBS, um, who's, a, you know, kind of a big figure in the book. Um, they were part of that 15 man team and, and they went in with their GPMGs and they, they killed you know, scores and scores of Al Qaeda, and they were they were central to preventing Al Qaeda from breaking out of the fort, uh, taking over the whole thing, and then breaking out because this was all really a tr- sort of Trojan horse plot to take back. Ma- very clever, actually, and it could have worked uh, to take back Maz- Masri Sharif, which would have turned the t- whole tide of the war. So, you know, I just found it just a fascinating narrative. You know, with lots of sort of 
gritty, granular detail that I could sort of piece together, but also spoke to the strategic picture of Afghanistan before 9-11, how the West responded, and, you know, how this sort of fitted in, how this was the sort of forerunner to the next 20 years. Um, and, the, you know, one of the sort of tragedies and, you know, ironies, I think, is that the um, the success of this, the success the Americans experienced in this early period, because lots of people were predicting, you know, being bogged down through to the spring of 2002. But in fact, the Taliban fell within with, within weeks. But we then changed and we it made us more ambitious. And, uh, you know, the Bush administration kind of moved into nation building. The Pentagon, you know, wanted in on the action. So you had tens of thousands of conventional troops. And I think it also emboldened the US and, you know, by extension at that point, Britain, um, into going into Iraq because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, regime change is pretty straightforward. You know, <laughs> let's do another one, yeah. which of course then took our eye off the ball in Afghanistan, which led to, you know, the sort of catastrophe we've, we've just seen. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, thank you so much for that. Now, um, it, it dawned on me just, just actually, I don't know why it dawned on me this morning, but we're coming up to the 20th anniversary of the events that we're talking about. Yeah. And obviously, poor old Mike Spann was killed on the 25th of November, 2001. So could you just talk to us a bit about sort of Mike Spann, who he was, yeah. and a little bit about sort of contact with the family and sort of researching into him? So, you know, Mike Spann, he was a Marine Corps, op- he was 32 years old, mm. former Marine Corps officer, Anglico, so Av- Avil, um Air, naval, gunfire, liaison. So sort of kind of airstrike type of guy. He was um, he was from Alabama, um, from a very sort of conservative, sort of small town, southern American background. And I have actually come to s- sort of regard him in, in, in many ways as sort of the personification of America after 9-11. Mm. I mean, he was, in, he was in CIA headquarters on 9-11 and all non-essential personnel were ordered to evacuate. And that was anybody really outside mm. um, the counterterrorism center. And he was a paramilitary special activities division. And he was angry. You know, he was furious. He was like, you know, we're the CIA. We don't go home. You know, you know, we, we're the people that do something. And that was very much his personality. And he, he sort of, you know, battles to get on that team. Mm. He had a sick, he had a, well, at, the, at the time, a three month old uh, son um, from a, a new married marriage. He just remarried. He had two daughters from his first marriage, um, who I think were sort of nine and four. And so he had every reason not to go, but not only was he fine with going, um, he was eager, you know, more than eager to go. Um, and uh, so, you know, he was, he's often presented as sort of very black and white, you know, like, like again, like the sort of the, the Bush kind of approach. And, mm. and Mike was definitely a conservative and a, and a Republican um, and, you know, he sort of, he's, you know, stated that in emails and letters and it was, it was, it was part of his, um, his sort of character and personality. Um, and he, I think of, I mean, all eight of the, of the, of the members of Team Alpha, uh, you know, wanted to get in there and, you know, part of it was avenging 9-11 as per the subtitle of the book, but, you know, also getting the people who'd done it. Uh, um, stopping another attack, denying sanctuary to Al Qaeda. But I think Mike Spann had a real sort of burning intensity about him to sort of a- a- achieve uh, that mission. Um, I think he was, but you know, there was a very sort of thoughtful and meticulous side to him. I mean, he's he's he would be an easy person to sort of um, caricature or paint sort of two dimensionally. But I think he would have become a very senior CIA officer. I mean, he absolutely soaked up information. Um, if he was um, going to be talking to some prisoners the next day, he would he would uh, stay up most of the night, sort of formulating the questions in this sort of very neat s- script. And when he was working, he was relentless. There's sort of nothing he wouldn't do. I mean, he would sort of, you know, he's like almost like one of those dogs that, you know, hunting dogs that keeps on going until they're almost dead. You know, yeah. he had no sort of off switch. So an incredible guy. Um, and, you know, it's with some trepidation that you sort of deal with a story like that because in, in a way he's such a, a public figure and he's, he's, he's fixed in um, the public mind and he's become sort of, there's an element of him that has become public property and that's, but he's, he was a person and he was a father and a husband and a son. And so, I mean, it's very, uh, you know, 
difficult, understandably, uh, for, for families with, with in that kind of situation. And so Shannon Spann, um, I mean, Johnny Spann, Mike's father, had been has been quite public over the years and quite outspoken. And so, you know, I, I went to see Johnny um, in, in Winfield, Alabama, um, and I also interviewed Johnny's wife, Mike's mother, Gail. Uh, they were divorced. I mean, they were actually divorced in 2001. Um, and and then, you know, I contacted Shannon Spann, who, who didn't want to speak to me for, for months. Um, she's a, she was a CIA officer. She's remarried, uh, got a, a young son, um, and she's just been through, you know, there was a custody battle over the children. And it's, it's, it was incredibly tragic and complicated. You know, Mike was just sort of, Mike was sort of the glue that held a lot of this together. And he was just, he was just ripped out of it. And so, you know, it, it took a lot of, um, you know, sort of patience and, and me, you know, building up sort of credibility and, and trust and saying like, listen, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to do team alpha justice. I want to do the whole story justice and, and Mike's, my expand justice and I want to do this properly. And it, to an extent, you can only do that by, uh, it takes time because you have to demonstrate that that's the kind of person you are. And that helped that I've written a couple of other books. But, you know, I think once I've spoken to several members of Team Alpha and then senior CIA officers like Kofa Black and Hank Crompton, who was at headquarters running the, the war day to day, I think, you know, that gave Shannon Span, Mike's widow, um, a sort of, you know, she, she just texted me one day and said, people keep saying I need to sp- speak to you. So I guess mm-hmm. I will, you know, okay. and, yeah. and then of course, once I did speak to her, mm-hmm. she was, she was magnificent and, um, and very sort of generous and very, I mean, she done, she's, you know, she's been through a lot and she's, she's done therapy and she's reflected on the decisions she's made and how she's lived her life. And so she, along with David Tyson, actually were the two people who, were able to sort of go to go deeper all the time and, and and go into their own psychology and their own kind of makeup and reflect on uh, on on everything that happened, how it affected them, how they uh, behaved, what had motivated them, which I found wonderful because it, it gave to me it, to me it gave the story another dimension. It wasn't just this happened and that happened and here's the action and here's the bullets flying and this was the type of weapon and this was sad. It was it was much much more sort of richly textured than that in the end, and that's principally down, to, I think, to Shannon Span and David Tyson. Yeah, and that's what makes it an excellent book. It's a very good read. There's a lot of detail, and it's you know it's mainly about the people, as you say, more than the the uh, the kind of the spy tech, the weapons, and all that kind of stuff. Even though that stuff is there too, but it's like there are yeah. you know I've read a lot of books over the years, and people do get a bit fixated on tactics and and so on. I think I, I heard you in another interview talk about how um, you know some people remember things in different ways, um, and it helps you build a bigger picture. I don't know if there's anything you want to sort of say about that. Yeah, I mean I found this sort of repeatedly and it's sort of incredible um mm. i mean i particularly remember it from dead men risen when there was a there was a very sort of traumatic incident when um uh i think it was a ridgeback uh, armored vehicle rolled into a canal and you sort of had eight guys trapped inside welsh guardsmen and then you had uh uh royal tank regiment who were on this on the scene and nobody died uh, miraculously but you know these guys were you know, clutching each other's sort of hands underwater. And one of them had um, like a sonogram picture of his unborn child. He was clutching to his chest. I mean, these guys thought they were going to die. And some of them blacked out and and were in, one was in a coma for several days. But I interviewed probably close to 20 people who were involved in that incident. And they all had their own perspectives. And uh, I mean, the Welsh Guardsmen would remember almost entirely what Welsh Guardsmen did mm. and minimize what the Royal Tank Regiment people did because they just didn't know them. And then the Royal Tank Regiment completely the other way. So it's like a sort of like, you know, those fairground mirrors where mm. there's all this mm. sort of distortion. And and I found that the more I talked to them, you know, the the less clear it became in some ways. <laughs> and then at that point you had to sort of take a step back and 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 sort of work it out and you can't ever get to i mean rudyard kipling wrote about this this sort of uh phenomenon you can't ever get the absolute truth but but you sort of soak up 
you know, what everybody said and how they are. And then you, you sort of, it's like a puzzle. You think about, you know, what their perspective was, like, you know, psychologically, but also physically, what they could see and what they couldn't. Because also, obviously, everybody talks amongst each other and they start repeating things other people have said and they and they believe that they've seen them. So that, that's why it's very good to talk to people very soon after things happened. And, you know, I absolutely found that with, with Kalajanki. I mean, co- complete sort of chaos. And so it's like, um, you know, I remember in, actually in the Navy with navigation, you have a fix. You know, you, you take um, a bearing from three different, um, you know, landmarks. And, and, and then where you are is, 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 is in the center. And so it's a little, it's a little bit like that. So you have all these perspectives, but they actually never intersect right in the middle. This is sort of a little bit of a sort of a square. And that's where the sort of judgment and sort of creativity of sort of narrative fiction comes in because you, you know, you, ca- you know, the only way you could, um, you know, capture the full truth would be to have sort of 12 video cameras at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. And then you couldn't, and then you couldn't possibly make sense of it even then. So you have to sort of, filter stuff out and you have to you know put it all together so it's a to me it's one of the things you know alongside i think probably meeting the people and getting Mm. to know people Mm. that makes writing a book you know such a an amazing experience yeah no fantastic can you talk to us then about the events of uh Kalia Jangi, isn't it? I think I pronounced it. Kalia Jangi, and yeah. what it was that Mike Spann and David Tyson were doing there. What kind of information they were looking for, um, and obviously what transpired. So Kalia Jangi, um, sort of House of War is the is the translation. So it's nineteenth mm. century fort just west of Masri Sharif, and so November the, on the November the twenty fourth two thousand and one, there'd been uh, a weird sort of surrender. So four hundred Al Qaeda uh, fighters had turned up. Uh, on the east side of Masri Sharif to give themselves up. Now, there had been a surrender negotiated between Dostum and Mullah Fazl, who was a Taliban commander in the north, who's actually back in the Taliban government now, and a, a, a guy who carried out sort of brutal, you know, massacres of Hazaras across um, ac- across the north. Um, so there'd been this sort of, you know, opaque, you know, ambiguous surrender, which was very sort of Afghan type of thing. Um, and these 400 had turned up, and they had been put, it was getting dark on November 24th, and they'd been put into the basement of a building called the Pink House uh, inside Kalajangi. And that was that was a, an Afghan t- decision. So 400 of them, uh, as they were being unloaded from the trucks, uh, one of them set off a grenade, like a suicide attack, killed two of Dostum's senior guys, yeah. killed himself. And, um, you know, that obviously increased sort of the chaos. And they're all shoved into this into this cellar. Uh, which I went into a year ago, which is sort of very eerie sort of place. A lot of people died down there. Um, <clears throat> and um, But what happened was the Green Berets that night, the, their commanders up in Uzbekistan sort of said like, okay, this is too dangerous. No, Green Berets should go go in there. And the next morning, but there was a sort of imperative for the CIA. These were Al-Qaeda. They weren't Taliban. They were all foreign fighters. The so-called American Taliban, John Walker Lind, uh, was one of them, um, unbeknown to the Americans. But there was, you know, David Tyson and Mike Spann uh, w- were the two CIA officers on the ground. Justin Sapp, a third officer, was supposed to be going in, but he had to deliver a vehicle. Again, it's sort of the the, the chaos of war, really. There's, you know, there are all these, you know, all these things come together to create a, a sort of situation. If Justin had been with them, the whole, you know, the unfolding events may have been very different. But, you know, the main effort was in Kunduz. And so there were CR officers there. Most of the Green Berets were there. So David and Mike Spann went into the fort, uh, n- not alone because they had Northern Alliance guards with them and in- intelligence officers and people they trusted with their lives for the 40 days they'd been in the country. Um, but it was certainly, it was certainly a risk and it was certainly dangerous. And it, that was the case every day. This wasn't just another day. But it, you know, it was it was in that sort of category of you know sort of acceptable risk given the search, given the situation. And again, you're going back to sort of Mike Spann and his sort of mentality and the mentality of all these people. You know, there was no let's just wait another day or two. It was like we need to get in there. You know, this like this sort of imperative. So they went in, and the prisoners were were brought out of of the cellar, uh, sort of in ones and twos throughout the morning. Um, 
And, you know, there's video footage of this, which which was an amazing resource. In fact, there's sort of two sets of video footage. Um, and you can, there are all these prisoners, they're tied up with their turbans, their sort of hair's wild, they're sort of really dirty. A lot of them are sort of, you know, emaciated. Some of them are quite badly wounded from the battlefield. Also, there'd been a dispute in the cellar uh, the night before and, and um, the big grenades had gone off. Uh, and uh, so some of them had been killed the night before. Um, what sort of slowly became apparent that morning was these prisoners had not been searched properly at the surrender site. And so they'd come into the cellar with rifles, grenades, even a machine gun, knuckle dusters, all sorts of stuff. This is linked to this tradition, isn't it? In in Afghanistan, if you surrender, it's sort of honour and people don't yeah. get searched, do they? You sort of take about the word, but with uh, Al-Qaeda, obviously the foreign fighters, not familiar with this tradition. <laughs> exactly right. So, you know, it was a very Afghan sort of surrender. Yes, an honour is part of it. And so often people will just surrender and they'll change sides or mm. they'll go home. Mm. And, you know, also the Afghan, the Northern Alliance Afghans were terrified of these sort of boogeymen, almost these, these foreign fighters, particularly the Arabs. And, um, but yeah, this was, you know, Al Qaeda was not playing and Mullah Fazl, they were not playing by Afghan rules. So there were a lot of weapons in there. And there was actually a sort of stack of weapons that had been confiscated from the guys that were brought up, um, from the cellar and um, Amanala, who was one of the Afghans, an Afghan intelligence officer who was very close to, to David Tyson, said when David went into the pink house at one point, um, and actually there's video footage of this because David was filming some video, he says, it's not, it's not safe for you here. And so there's this, you know, there's this sense of there's all these Al Qaeda guys, a lot of them are talking. Uh, they're from every country you could imagine. There are sort of, Uyghurs, Arabs, Africans, there are some Caucasians, you know, Mike Spann singled out John mm. Walker Lind, who had told another prisoner, an Iraqi prisoner, that that um, that he, John Walker Lind, was an Irishman, and he did have an Irish grand, grandmother, and he'd been instructed to say that he was Irish, because to say that he was American, even for his fellow Al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters, was just information he shouldn't share. And But, but Mike Spann sort of fixated on, on Lind, and um, was, you know, questioning him, questioning him extensively. And that's on video. So John Walker Lynn doesn't say a word. You know, he just keeps his head down, which was unusual even that day because all these guys, nearly all these guys were speaking, even if it was, you know, lies and and kind of obvious rubbish, like, oh, I'm a Mossad agent yeah. or, yes. oh, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a CIA agent too. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff. But they were sort of saying something and yeah. John, John Walker Lim wasn't saying anything. And so there's this sort of ratcheting up of the pressure. And, you know, I talked to David about this because you listen to his voice. It's different. Uh, it's strained. He's very rough, you know. And, you know, there was certainly, a, you know, he swears, we all swear. Um and but it was sort of it was different it was it was also playing a role because mm, there was a mm. good cop and a bad cop and yeah, actually mike yeah. was the good cop and david was a bad cop but when i asked him about this he said he said yeah my wife said that he said that's not you and i think what was happening you know in hindsight it was a sort of the the danger and the situation he had recognized it sort of physiologically before his brain had reached the conclusion this is too dangerous. We need to, we need to leave now. And, um, you know, there were, uh, you know, a dozen or 18 or so prisoners still in the cellar. Um, and then Syed Carmel, who was Dostum's, uh, intelligence chief sort of in, in the, in the Masri Sharif where, whereas Manla was intelligence chief sort of in the mountains. He said, I think they're Uzbeks and I think these are serious guys. Um, and then around about 11, 11 a.m., uh, there's, uh, you know, an explosion, gunfire and shouting. And the prisoners uh, had uh, um, overcome the guards inside uh, sort of at the top of the steps coming out of the cellar. They killed a manala. Uh, they killed a bunch of guards, grabbed their weapons and sort of all hell breaks loose. Mike Spann was quite close to the pink house and he was... Um, he was trying to speak to some English speaking. Mike didn't speak any languages. Um, I mean, he he would have done. I mean, that was his, you know, that was one of his sort of ambitions really was to sort of become a fully fledged case officer. And I, I believe he would have done. 
Uh, but David was the linguist, so he he was you know speaking um, to the sort of you know the Uzbeks and the Russian speakers and or, uh, and the Dari speakers and all, all those people. And so Mike was quite close to the Pink House. So he had a rifle. He had a Kalashnikov and AKMS rifle with him, and he pulled it. It was sort of hanging on his back, and he pulled it round, and he he shot a bunch of prisoners that were rushing towards him, two or three. Um, at the same time, the prisoners who had lined up in the sort of courtyard in front of the pink house rushed him from behind and jumped on on top of him. And so he went down in in sort of like a melee, a sort of pile of bodies. And David was, uh, you know, about 50 yards or so away. And, you know, he hears the commotion and he almost immediately starts to experience tunnel vision, loss of hearing, time slowing down, classic, you know, psychological responses to highly stressful sort of combat situations. And so he hears Mike shouting his name, Dave, Dave, Dave. And so instead of running the other way, uh, David runs towards Mike. And on the way, a prisoner who he'd, who he'd been interrogating earlier comes at him with a Makarov pistol, Russian pistol. And David's, you know, described how he could remember seeing the cartridge case- cases um, being uh, thrown out from the pistol, and 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 looking at the guy had a, guy had a st- strange stance. He was sort of sh- shooting sort of sideways, not very effectively. Mm, no gangster style. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, and David was like, you know, what the f is he doing? Yeah. And then he's like, oh, he's effing trying to kill me. Uh, and, and then he, <laughs> David, says to himself, well shoot the MF, you know, and, and then he shoots him dead twice and, and then gets to Mike. Um, he shoots, there's four guys on top of Mike, um, who, who, you know, it's, it's hard to know, but you know, we, one presumes were prisoners, um, who had been lined up, who were on top of Mike, uh, and David shoots all four of them. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. He shoots each of them twice, you know, presumably kills them. um, and David's just in another realm at this point. So he kicks Mike's on the bottom. He kicks Mike. There's, there's no movement, and there's blood on the on on the ground. And um, Mike. So David didn't have a, a rifle with him that day. So he picks up Mike's rifle. He's David's also got his Browning high power pistol, and um, and then he has to. He's in this situation of kill or be killed. And so he always says to me, you know, he, he, there was no sort of option. And so he kills, he kills his way out. And this guy's, there's grenades bouncing off his chest and his, his thigh that didn't explode. Um, there's people sort of head busting him because a lot of them are still tied up. And there's people, you know, like a sort of comic Western where there's a guy popping out from behind a tree shooting at him and he shoot, they're each missing each other. At one point, there's a guy who's um, a, a prisoner who's holding one of the Uzbek guards captive mm. with a grenade with a pin taken out of it in front of him. Yeah. Basically kind of gesturing, okay, if you kill, if you shoot me, this guy's going to die. I'm going to die. And you're going to die as well because it's all very close. And, um, and actually David didn't, didn't shoot that guy, but then Syed Carmel, the intelligence chief comes up from behind David and shoots the prisoner dead. The grenade explodes and, and kills the Northern lights. So just incredible sort of close quarters, uh, combat. Now, it's Mike Span died from two gunshot wounds to the head. That's what the autopsy concluded, and uh, so it seems that he was killed in the in the, he went down fighting and was killed in the in the first seconds. Um, David eventually uh, reaches the the building on the northern side of the of the fort, which is where he bumps into the German TV crew. But he's then got another sort of five hours in that building. U.S. He calls he calls his wife who drops the phone in Tashkent. Um, he calls the embassy, um, and so the alert is uh, eventually raised. Um, uh, airstrikes come in, uh, so there's seven airstrikes on the um, uh, on the fort that day. Um, the 15 man rescue team comes in, and they're trying to get to David uh, and the other people trapped inside the headquarters building. Uh, the SBS sort of set up their position and start sort of laying down fire with their GPMGs. Um, and But it Steph Bass, the SEAL, goes forward at dusk and fi- 
picks up a Kalashnikov from a dead Afghan and uh, incredible stuff. He was awarded the Navy Cross for his actions that day. And he spots Mike Spann's body, fire, he fires shots either side of the body to see if there's any sort of flinching or anything. There's, there's, there's no movement. So it sort of convert, confirms his death. But it took six days to um, to sort of quell the revolt. You had AC-130 gunships coming in. You had a 2,000-pound um, bomb dropped on a friendly position by yeah. Um, yeah. an American aircraft, uh, which, you know, was sort of catastrophic, killed a lot of Afghans wounded some of the SBS and and, and five Americans. So an incredible um, kind of scene that ends, you know, Mike Spann's body is eventually, it takes several days to have his his body um, recovered. Um, And so, you know, a sort of remarkable battle right at the beginning of of this war. Yeah. What is Mike Spann's legacy today? How is he remembered and how is he missed? So, I mean, obviously on a personal level, husband, father and, and, and son, I mean, the I mean, there's a fr- friend of his called Brian who's actually served with him in the Marine Corps and is now the head of the Special Activity Center at CIA. So he's still serving, and he said, you know, we we miss Mike every day on a professional level because we mm. believe he would have been a senior officer mm. and he would be doing great things now. And in fact, Andy, who is the only member of Team Alpha who's still serving in the CIA, he's he's in a he's in a senior position, and uh, almost all of the um, members of Team Alpha, I think uh, four or five of them reached SIS, which is Special uh, Senior Intelligence Service, so like the the senior echelons of the the CIA. I mean, I think Mike is remembered as somebody who sort of personified the lean forward, send me, get things done um, kind of mission after 9-11, and a sort of a period where the country was, we knew it was not going to last, even the time I remember thinking this, but the country was united behind a sort of single aim. And you look at how divided we are now here, it's, a, you know, and, and Britain is the same um, in different ways. Um, it, it's sort of incredible. You know, Bush had a 90% approval rating. One member of Congress voted against authorizing force in Afghanistan. The, the UN was on board. NATO invoked Article 5. You know, so everybody was together, and and in some ways that's sort of a, you know, a wonderful moment. And to bring it right up to now, I feel that there are echoes of Mike in what's happening now, and it, and in particularly, so Shannon Span is deeply involved in helping getting Afghans out. So is David Tyson. So is Justin Sapp. And so these people that were. Uh, you know, alongside Afghans, fighting alongside Afghans, or whose whose husband was yeah. as a fellow CI officer in two thousand and one, are sort of paying paying it back and helping to get these. You know, they're they're very distressed about what's happened and the mm. you know and the um, the botched evacuation and, and all the rest of it. But they're sort of channeling that into helping get Afghans out, and that issue of helping Afghans is something that you know, I guess 80% of Americans uh, are on board with. And so to me, the there are sort of faint echoes of the post 9-11 period in what's happening now, where people are, are putting the sort of partisan politics aside and dealing with the sort of humanitarian issue and the issue of sort of principle of, of, of helping these Afghan allies. And I, you know, I see, you know, Mike Spann, um in 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 some of that um also his his children um i i grown up obviously you know jake who was a a six month old you know is now 20 actually i just got a text from him yesterday and we're gonna meet up hopefully um and you know them the the girl's mother died of cancer at the end of that year at the end of 2001 so they so they were basically they were orphans you know they lost they'd lost two parents and so they've grown up with all they've grown up with all this and each of them in their own way have become sort of wonderful people so you know mike lives on in them and um the members of team alpha are planning to go to arlington cemetery um you know for the 20th anniversary of his death and and pay their respects as they um you know, as they have done previously individually, but but not as a group. So, you know, he's 
yeah, there are charities, the CIA Officers Memorial Foundation and the, uh, the Third Option uh, Foundation, which is specifically for the families of paramilitaries. And all that was started um, because of the sort of the first casualty, uh, Mike, because he was the, you know, 70, I think he was, he was the 79th star on the CIA Memorial War. Then there are now 137. Wow. So there's been, a, you know, mm, for a small mm. organization, a lot of being, people being killed. So he's, mm. he's, he's very, you know, he's very much remembered. And, you know, part of my intention with this book was to, you know, to sort of fix his place in, yeah. in history. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Where can listeners sort of find out more about you and your excellent book? <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm trying to be very easy to get hold of. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> so <laughs> the website um, is Toby Harnden, H-A-R-N-D-E-N.com. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Toby Harnden. Just to be different, on Instagram, I'm at Toby Harnden one. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, if you Google, if if you Google a name, uh, you, you you will find it, and it's you know the book is available. Uh, there's, a, there's a UK edition by Welbeck, a US edition by Little Brown, and there's a there's a great audio version and Kindle. So you know, what, what what's the phrase? Wherever books are sold. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Toby. Well, thank you, Chris. I've I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. Well, if it ain't Simone Hicks. Juggling school, tennis. It's your journey. What if I made the wrong choice coming to college here? You do you. You are looking at the new face of HBCU baseball. What if I'm not good enough? Basically, you're scared every damn day, bro. The series premiere. Never let anything keep you from your dream. All-American Homecoming. Tonight on The CW. Tonight at 9, only on DCW 50. Washington CW.